You're listening to Petticoats and Poppies. History Girls at the Movies. Welcome to Petticoats and Poppies, History Girls at the Movies. We are your hosts, Maggie and... Nicole. So today we've decided to do something a bit different for our 50th episode. Instead of reviewing a specific historical film, we're actually going to be talking about films that we would like to see made, specifically films about female historical figures that we love. It, you know, it worked really well with Chevalier whenever we manifested that film. So maybe we'll be able to manifest one of these. But we also have a bigger reason that we're not doing our normal type of episode today. Yes. So we have been living in unprecedented times for a while now. But with the industry-wide strike, it's like just truly been a fascinating time to not only be a member of the SAG-AFTRA, but also a film critic and a historian. Uh, Like this is a historic period of time that we are going through in like labor strikes. Like it is just a fascinating time to be like observing all of this. Uh, And this is also the first time in over 60 years that we've had both SAG-AFTRA and uh, the Writers Guild of America on strike and a dual strike is just like such a huge thing uh and you know we could have had a little bit more uh had the dga not sold us you know out with having themselves come to a contract with the studios but that's their prerogative they had different needs i can understand that but still it would have been really nice to have like an actual industry wide strike right now to really hit it where it hurts because ai is dangerous uh and you know i have had a studio try to scan me i have friends who have been misled about the dangers of AI and are now owned digital copies of them by studios like Warner Brothers and Netflix and Disney. Uh, It's, it's a weird time to, you know, exist. Um, And, you know, while Nicole and I can safely review films um, since we are film critics, um, we, we just don't want to cross that line with the podcast and promote anything from Struck Studios right now. So we have decided to pivot a little bit um, uh, and talk about, you know, like Nicole said, these incredible women in history, um, because we just don't want to give any additional uh, promo to these studios until they provide equitable wages and safe working conditions and fair stipulations for their actors and writers. Now, to start, though, we did want to mention a couple of films that do already exist as a way of talking about sort of what we're looking for whenever we look for a female historical biopic film. So my three that I thought of immediately in terms of ones that are my favorites are Josie Rook's Mary Queen of Scots, Belle, and then Colette. And the thing that I like about Belle and Colette is that they're both about sort of lesser known female figures in history or people that, you know, even if people know the name Colette, they typically don't know the story behind that. Uh, And I really like sort of bringing these figures that a lot of people may have only heard their name or maybe they don't know of them at all to light through films like this. It's that whole thing of, you know, as much as I love Anne Boleyn, we don't need another Anne Boleyn project. We need things about, you know, figures that aren't as well known. But the other one, Mary Queen of Scots, who obviously is a figure who's had like several films made about her. I think that that's a really interesting film because it is a really great example of a female director and writer coming in and giving a very much more feminist take on the figures of of Mary Stewart and Elizabeth Tudor. And, And it's a film where you can really feel a female director's hand in it. And obviously that's something that whenever I envision movies about any of the women that I'm going to talk about today, I would love to see them done by, you know, female or or non-binary writers and directors, because I think that there really is something to be said for women telling women's stories. I completely agree. And, you know, um, looking at these films and trying to come up with my own three that I love was so hard because I didn't want to just do what you already had because I also <laughs> love Mary Queen of Scots yeah. and I also love Belle. Uh, so I went <laughs> a slightly different direction and it's not even as like, I don't know, maybe not as meaningful as your selections. Um, okay, I but I, I love, I can see Maggie's list and I love the ones that she has picked. <laughs> I, this is a film that we've talked about on here. It mm-hmm. is like the Countess, um, about the Countess Bathory, uh, a, a character that, in history that like seemingly 
haunted me the entire time after I discovered her existence <laughs> uh, in such a weird way. And I, I don't want to say I relate it with her as a figure in history, but there's a lot to appreciate in the way that like she was a strong-willed woman in a man's world. And it was ultimately a, the man's world that took her out because of her like just prowess and her like strength. Uh, and I think so that's a very interesting character and I would love to see that may maybe even her story told again sometime in a television series. We have an even more time to like dig into who she was like as a person and like the infamy that she is surrounded around. And it's just just a fascinating figure in history. And I think there's a lot to play with there. And I really do love the Countess and I love Julie Dudley's stuff work. Uh, and it's just a great it's a great film. I also this one is not particularly a good film. But it is a film that I love. Valid. <laughs> it makes me feel good. I own it on DVD. I watched it a ton when it came out. I saw it in theaters twice. It is Becoming Jane. What we're saying with Becoming Jane is actually, I'm going to cut in here and take it from you. Um, what we're saying is cast hot people in female biology. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Literally Tom LaFroy. I think of him all the time. I think of James McAvoy as him. Yes. Perfect. 10-10. No, no issues. <laughs> His Tom LaFroy also helped me feel better about how I felt about Mr. Tumnus. So shout out Yes. <laughs> yes. And it definitely made me feel better about that. I was not quite prepared to. I was like, oh, thank God. It's it, it's just James it, McAvoy. Okay. It's just McAvoy. <laughs> he doesn't have, he doesn't have yeah. fur. Um, <laughs> which later in life, I'd be like, oh, that's fine. Um. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> wasn't quite there yet back then um and then to, to bring it all in to, to, to tone it down i really like a private war um i think it's an excellent film rosamund pike is very good in it and i think it's a little more it's not contemporary because obviously it's still technically a historical film but i i find war correspondence to be very interesting and i just think this is a very very interesting very well done film and i think it, it's overall like fairly well like received i think people gave it really decent reviews when it came out not that long ago either but i i really love rosamund pike um i would watch her in almost anything <laughs> i'm gonna give a quick shout out to another rosamund pike biopic film which is radioactive which is a super yes. cool movie about marie curie i would watch Mar like rosamund pike in anything uh but i love that movie and again I think Radioactive is a super fun film because it takes a woman that like everybody knows Marie Curie's name, but I feel like a lot of people like don't know much about her as a person. And God, I also, I, you know, you picked really good. Just, I love A Private War. I think that's a great movie. And yeah, and it's also a reminder that like, whenever we talk about female biopics, it doesn't just have to be like an old Hollywood actress or a queen of somewhere. And yeah. I feel like that's what we get most of the time. <laughs> Rosman's also in another really good film. Uh, it's not a biopic, but it is about a female, not a good person technically, but it's the Seven Days of Intube, uh about oh, okay, yeah. uh, like the revolutionary cell of the bunch that hijacked the flight. And I wonder where you were going with that. Like, yeah, what are we talking about? <laughs> it also it also features Daniel Bruhl. So like, okay, I everything makes all. sense again. <laughs> yeah, if Daniel Bruhl's in it. If Rosamund Pike's in it, I'm watching mm -hmm, it. Like, mm -hmm. I'm just saying. I love this. Thank you. <laughs> but anyways, um, some of these movies that I feel like we're going to be like, we want to see this movie. It's kind of a weird thing because it's like, yeah, but we want to see it written by us. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. As I was writing all of my my sections out, I was like, yeah. and this is how I would do it. And these are the things, these are the moments in their life that Same. I think are worthy of being explored. And here's like this title I came up with. I was like, literally like, and here's the title of the movie. <laughs> like, here's who yeah. cast. Um, and then I was like, wait, I'm, I shouldn't share that. <laughs> I was like oh man they're gonna come with for our ideas but if anybody would like no um <laughs> we're open to working with you though um <laughs> yes once the strike is over yes we will call us up we have yeah. tons of ideas yeah or if you want to uh, work with one of the companies that has uh yeah there are what is it now Neon, 39 A24. independent companies that yeah. have um amazingly how indie with. films can come to an agreement with our requests it's funny how an indie studio can agree to, you know, all of the conditions that these actors and writers are asking for when supposedly a big studio can't. Um, it's tell, it, it really tells you that it's, it. it's it, it really does tell you that it's not about them not being able to 
adhere to to what is being asked for. It's about them not being willing to. Yeah. It's almost like indie companies get the need to um, make money to survive, um, whereas Mm -hmm. Mr. Mm -hmm. Three Yachts doesn't care. Yeah. It's funny how that works. You'd almost think that. (laughs) Yeah. It's so funny. Um, So now we get to dive into these wonderful ideas that we have. Um, This whole episode was actually largely inspired by a recent trip that I had to the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C., where I literally was like killing time before a screening of a film. And I was like, you know what? I want to find like all of the interesting women here. There was a lot of really interesting like pop out exhibits they have like they have a louisa may alcott let like has her like a bust of her and then they have a big sign talking about like her life and then then a couple different rooms they have like these other like pullouts that's like this whole room is filled with men's portraits but here this really interesting story about one of their wives which i really appreciate it but then i was also looking at other like paintings of women and like trying to see what their stories were because sometimes you know it would be a story about her or a story like about the painter, if it was a female painter, it was just, I was just perfect, like purposely searching for this stuff. Cause um, I just don't know if I've looked at it in the same way the last time I, I was there, um, which is like five years ago before the pandemic. It's, it's been a while. Um, but I came across this woman um, by the name of Margaret Fuller and she seems to have had such a remarkable life. And given the era that she lived in, she accomplished so much in the short period of time that she she lived on this earth. Uh, so Margaret Fuller was an American journalist, a literary critic, a German translator, and a women's right activist uh, who was heavily involved in the transcendentalist movement of the time. She is also the first American woman to become a war correspondent and the first female correspondent for the New York Tribune. Born Sarah Margaret Fuller in Cambridge, Massachusetts, she gained a head start in the world because her father, who was a member of the U.S. House of Representatives, invested in her education. He taught her to read and write by the age of three. He refused to let her read any sort of feminine etiquette books. He thought that wasn't something that she needed in her life. And by the time that she was 15, she was reading and translating Latin proficiently. She then returned this investment by becoming a teacher, specifically overseeing classes that were meant to provide education to women who didn't otherwise like have access to upper education in the way that men did. By the time that she was 30, Margaret became the first editor of the Transcendentalist journal, The Dial. Frederick Henry Hedge, Theodore Parker, and Ralph Waldo Emerson were also considered for this job before her, but she got it over these three men. She went on to become what is considered the best read person in New England of the time for either a man or a woman. And she was also the first woman allowed to use the Harvard College's library, which was like a big thing at the time. Um, She was also an avid reader. Um, She was known for translating German literature, and she actually helped to bring the German romanticism to the United States. Like she was the one that introduced it to like the, the literary, like thought makers of like the New England movement at that time. Mind you, all of this happened in the 19th century. She was born in 1810. She died at the age of 40 in in 1850. She did all of this in the 19th century before the Civil War. Like, so much. Unfortunately, she died in a shipwreck off the coast of New York when she and her partner Giovanni Ossoli and their child were returning from Italy. Uh, Days before they set sail, she wrote a note actually predicting her own death. She wrote, I am absurdly fearful and various omens have combined to give me a dark feeling. It seems to me that my future upon earth will soon close. I have a vague expectation of some crisis. I know not what. This was written mere days before the shipwreck. These are the additional reasons why I think that there should be a movie about her. She was present when the Marquis de Lafayette laid the first cornerstone at the Bunker Hill Monument to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the war. She later wrote to him, uh, and the letter said something to the likes of, like, basically, remember my name. Um, What she penned was, should we both live, and it is possible to a female to whom the avenues of glory are seldom accessible, I will call my name to your recollection. Which is, like, such a ballsy, like, move for a woman of that time. 
just I love it. She also helped her father during John Quincy Adams' presidential campaign. Um, she worked, obviously, at the Dial alongside literary greats like Emerson. Um, she was also embroiled in this public scandal by association um, when Edgar Allan Poe got publicly called out for maybe but not actually having an affair with this married poet that he had like a friendly flirtation with. And it all happened because like a, f a female friend of Margaret's was jealous that Poe was friendly with this other woman. And so she concocted this whole thing that he was having an affair with her because she was jealous and wanted to like ruin both of them. And because Margaret was friends with this woman, like Poe referred to them as like busy bodies. It was like a whole thing. And like people got all mad at each other. It was just very funny. I love Poe. So I thought like her association with Poe was like, just, it made me happy. She also almost met Elizabeth Barrett, but basically a misconnection because Elizabeth was too busy eloping with Robert Browning at the time. <laughs> so like they just missed each other. Um, and then Fair by enough. the time, yeah. And then by the time that Elizabeth was not busy anymore, Margaret was unfortunately dead. The, the Tribune also sent her to Rome as this foreign correspondent. And this is how she becomes like the first American woman to be a war correspondent. The Tribune sends her to Rome to cover the revolution for Italian freedom. Mind you all, this is like the 1840s, the 1830s. Like it, this is such a weird, wild time to imagine a woman being sent by her work to go cover a war. This is also while she's like on a silent assignment in Italy. That's where she meets and falls in love with Giovanni Ossoli. And they live together. They have a child together. But they probably never actually got married. Because they were two different religions. She was Protestant and he was Catholic. And like it, it depending on where you read, what sources you read about her. Some say they never got married. Some say they secretly married but then, then died on their way back. Like, there's all this mystery about it, but I don't think they ever got married. Which, again, remember the time, 1840s, like, living in sin. <laughs> living... <laughs> like, it's just, it's so unheard of at this time. Oh, my God, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> also, also, again, contextualizing the time period of this. This is before the Civil War. She was an advocate for prison reform. She was also an abolitionist and you even have like people like Susan B. Anthony citing her as the inspiration for their own participation in the movement. Like all of this by the time she was 40 and then she was dead. I just cannot wrap my head around it and I don't understand why there's not a movie about her or a, a series. Like why? But I'm so curious to know who you've picked. And I have a feeling it's one that I've heard you talk about before. Yes, you definitely, anyone who knew me through my college years has has heard about my first one. I obviously first had to talk about Julita Lespinas, my girl, who has long been a love of mine. And I really am determined to do something one day to share her story with people, whether it's sort of in a, in a creative way or a more academic way. I, I have shared about her at a couple of research conferences in the past uh, because I discovered her through my research for my undergraduate thesis, which was about the French Enlightenment salonniers or the women who ran the salons that thinkers like Voltaire and Rousseau and D'Alembert all hung out in. And Julie, Julie, like her other, you know, Solonier contemporaries, uh, not only managed to get a great education for herself in a time when girls in France really didn't get an education anywhere other than the convent by attending and later hosting her own salon. But she was also really vital to the development of Enlightenment ideas because these women created a space in which these philosophes could discuss and share their work and test out their ideas and and develop a lot of the, the thinking that, you know, so much of our modern thought today is based off of. But Julie was born uh, Julie Jeanne Eleanor de Lespinas in 1732 in Lyon, France. And she was actually born to the Comtesse d'Albon out of wedlock. And so she was sort of in a difficult situation. Her mother's husband had already died. So she was quite obviously sort of not legitimate as her older siblings were. But she was educated in a convent like most well-to-do girls in that time period were if they got any education at all. She was very bright, very smart, took to things really easily. 
And at the age of 16, she was set up to be the governess to the children of her mother's legitimate daughter, the Marquise de Vichy, which is a really weird situation to be in. Like, it's her half-sister, but she's the legitimate half-sister. And, you know, not the best setup for her, really. But it's in that household that she meets the Marquise de Defond, who Madame de Defond was a, a really popular salonier in sort of the earlier Enlightenment period. She may also have been Julie's aunt because her brother is the man that like some people think, at least Julie's first like biographer in the later 1800s thought was her father. Um, it was never like officially confirmed who her father was, but um, certainly Madame de Defon took to her really quickly. They struck up a really affectionate friendship and there's a lot of letters between the two of them um, after they first met. And like I said, Madame de Defon, she was a salonier. She hosted one of like the most important enlightenment salons, all the famous, like, philosoph that you've heard of would go to her salon. Um, and in 1754, she convinced uh, Julie, who was 22 at the time, to come to Paris to work as her companion, help her run the salon. She was basically going blind. And so she sort of used that as an excuse to say, Julie, I need for you to come so you can read things to me, write my letters for me, all that sort of stuff. Um, but also from the letters between them, it also definitely seems like it was a way to sort of get her out of her half sister's household, um, and into sort of these intellectual circles and no surprise. Um, she really thrived in them. She sort of became the star of Madame du Defon's, uh, salon. She made a lot of friends. She was very quick witted, very bright, like I said. And so after they had been together about 10 years, you know, living in the same lodgings and everything, uh, in 1764, Madame du Defon discovered that Julie had been hosting small gatherings while she was, you know, napping or, or indisposed before she held her salon. And she was already sort of jealous of Julie's popularity at that point uh, and felt that she was sort of eroding her own power. So she basically threw a fit and kicked Julie out of her house where she'd been living for 10 years. Um, so luckily, Julie had a lot of friends, um, one of which was Madame Geoffrin, who was another one of the like most famous uh, saloniers of this time period who had like a little bit of a feud with Madame du Defond. Um, so she was more than happy to help set Julie up. Uh, and also D'Alembert was a really good friend of hers and a couple of other friends set Julie up with her own lodgings in a salon of the Rue Saint-Dominique. Um, and basically like these friends just funded her. Most of the saloniers were sort of the wives of important men or they were widows or they were just sort of aristocratic women who had you know their own independent means of wealth and julie is is quite unique amongst the salon years for the fact that she you know is born to nobility but because she's illegitimate she's not inheriting that money um she sort of is more working class because she is you know from the age of 16 being made to work within her half sister's household um she sort of is one of the only ones who doesn't like have money of her own but d'alembert eventually moves in with her and they are really great friends she nurses him through an illness uh and he was deeply in love with her very head over heels thought she was like an angel on earth and she saw him as just her best friend uh but he actually had from all of his writing like a fairly good attitude about it even whenever he had to sort of watch her pursuing other men but she fell in love first with the Marquis de Mora, the son of the Spanish ambassador to France. And his family opposed the match. Obviously, like, she's this illegitimate daughter who's super involved in, like, intellectual circles. That's not really what, like, a Spanish noble family wants their son marrying into. Uh, and he actually had consumption. So he had to go back to Spain for a while because they thought that that would, like, heal him. And he was on his way back to marry her when he died, which is so tragic. And she's, like, very affected by it. But by the time that happens, by the time he like tries to head back to Paris, she's also sort of engaged with the flirtation with this other guy, the Comte de Guibert, who did not return her feelings, married another woman, but definitely was playing with her feelings and definitely enjoyed her like having feelings for him. Um, and yes, whenever I discovered these letters that she wrote to him, whenever I was in college, 
I would literally sit and cry over them sometimes. Uh, <laughs> but her letters to him, they really are heartbreaking. And they are considered today to be like a really great work of letter writing. And, and a lot of people sort of later on looked at these letters and thought, well, God, like if this is what she does just in a letter to the guy that she has feelings for, imagine what she could have done as an actual writer. You know, he married someone else. She sank into this deep depression and D'Alembert cared for her. Um, at the time, people were sort of like, oh, she died of heartbreak. Now some people think tuberculosis. There's a couple of different things people think it might have been, but D'Alembert sort of nursed her until her eventual death at the age of 43. And she died in Paris uh, on May 23rd, 1776. Now, her letters to her two lovers were published in 1809, and the Romantic era, like, poets and, and different artists were super into them. They thought they, they were great. And it is true, like, I've read them, and they really do sort of embody Romantic ideals in an earlier period, which is interesting. And I think there's – part of what is so fascinating about her is the fact that she's this figure within the Enlightenment, and she's, like – facilitating, you know, people like D'Alembert and Rousseau and, and uh, Voltaire and people like that with all of these, you know, enlightenment ideas. But at the same time in her personal life, she is so standing for more of like a romantic tradition and more of a, a sort of romantic sensibility that is so at odds with the enlightenment that I think it's, it's just really fascinating. The only biography that's like written straight about her was done by the novelist um, Naomi Royd Smith in 1931. And there's some scholars who've done work sort of on the salons and women in general. Dina Goodman has done some incredible like academic work on her. But as far as I know, she's never really been depicted um, on screen or there's a couple of book characters who are definitely like influenced by her, but not necessarily like like they don't have her name or anything. So I think she's so fascinating and such a, a, you know, interesting example of an early academic, but also a woman who like had really terrible luck in love, um, had this like best friend who was super in love with her, who like took it pretty well, like that she did not return his feelings. Well, what you're telling me is this film will have an uh, the vitamin string quartet version of a bunch of Taylor Swift songs. That's what I'm yes, getting. Pretty much. Like pretty Foolish much. One will be the credits. Like, yes. I don't know. Yes. We may get Taylor to record a song for the credits, actually. Yeah. She'll no, truly, these letters are like really something. And you can. I'm just saying, like, an amazing female writer. I'm like, Taylor Swift yeah. all over this. <laughs> right? You also can, they've published some of the letters between her and Madame du Défond, um before they moved in together. So from when Julie's like, I think she's like 18 to 22 in them. And they're also really interesting. And um, it's really sort of interesting to look at the ways that Madame du Défond like convinced her to move to Paris with her. But yeah, she's, she's my girl. She's my very flawed um, you know, heroine, and I love her, but it really amazes me. It's one of those figures where you're kind of like, I mean, it's, it's like with, frankly, it's like with Margaret Fuller. It's like, how has there not been a yeah. movie about this woman? Not to be John Green and segue from tuberculosis to also <laughs> consumptiveness. Um, <laughs> I'm going to talk uh, about a figure in history that is decently well known of and was also once described as having a consumptive personality, which I just think is like an accidental perfect segue. While we have gotten like really excellent, like a really excellent television series called Desperate Romantics, which featured Lizzie's story in part, the show did mostly focus on Rosetti uh, and the boys involved in the pre raphaelite movement. So think Effie Gray but actually good and interesting. And that is a movie about Elizabeth Siddle. Uh, Elizabeth Siddle is one of my favorite um, women in history. She is somebody who I have tried to emulate. Um, I just, everything about her and the way that uh, her existence makes me happy. Um, if that makes sense. Um Elizabeth Siddle was born in 1829 and began her career um, as a model for the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Um, in addition to sitting for Dante Gabriel Rossetti, she also modeled for Walter Deverell, William Holm Hunt, um, John Everett Millay. But, you know, enough about the men that painted her. Elizabeth Eleanor Siddle was born July 25th, 1829, which is actually tomorrow. Uh, so her birthday is tomorrow, which is a fun little 
little thing I realized while uh, researching her today. Uh, she was born in Hatton Garden, which is an area in London. Um, at the time of her birth, her father had a cut cutlery making business. And by the time she was two, the family actually moved across London to Southwark, which presently is one of my favorite areas in London. But back then it was like a fairly cheap place to live and not exactly a desirable place to be from, uh, which is just a shame because I love Southwark. She received a fairly ordinary education, you know, very much conformable to the condition of her life. Um, and according to like historians, she claimed the first time that she read Tennyson was by finding one or two poems of his that were used as like the packaging on butter. Uh, so, so apparently somebody was using like pages from a book to wrap up their, their goods at the market and she read it. Uh, and she was actually really inspired by Tennyson. If you've ever read any of the work that she wrote, uh, there's a lot of very very like similar styling and themes that she borrowed from Tennyson. So it's very clear that this like first encounter with this kind of writing just had like an indelible like mark on her creativity. Um, by the time she was 20, she was working um, at a millinery. So hat shop, which is where she was first spotted by Deverell. So there are three different like meeting lore around how Lizzie came into the pre-Raphaelite um, like realm. Some like there's this one story where basically like Devil was courting one of her co-workers and she would be like the person that would walk with them a few paces behind so they could have their moment after work or whatever. Uh, and then she like allegedly showed her paintings and her like work to Devil and they was like, oh, this is cool. Then there's another where he saw her and was like, oh, you would make a great model. Let's use you as a model. But a lot of historians believe that it's actually Deverell's father that introduced Lizzie to the, the younger Deverell and introduced Lizzie's artistic talents to the pre-Raphaelite movement. Essentially, like she had shown this older man some of her work. He was like, oh, my son's involved with these guys that do like paintings and drawings and stuff. I'm going to show him your work. And that's how that like meeting occurred. And I actually prefer this like variation of it because it means that it was by her merits, basically, that she was brought into the pre-Raphaelite and not just like, oh, you're pretty, come sit for a painting. That it's like literally that they took an interest in what she was able to bring to the movement herself and not just because she had pretty red hair. By 1852, Lizzie was like writing and publishing some of her own poetry and she was actually studying under Rossetti at that time to do paintings herself. Um, and they were also in a relationship at the time. These two had a very, very tumultuous relationship. But I also found today that they had absolutely hilarious nicknames for each other. And I don't, it's been a hot second since I watched Desperate Romantics, but I do not think that they included the fact that her nickname for him was Guggums. I can't even say that with a straight face. I, I'm. <laughs> I hope that was like ironic. Like, <laughs> and and so it was Guggum slash Gugs, and I just have so many questions about how this became her nickname for him because his right. nickname for her is normal. It's Dove. It's like every fan fiction nickname ever in existence. Yeah. Like yeah. the manic pixie dream girl of his you know existence. He called Dove, but she called him Guggums, which also. Feels like the nickname the Manic Pixie Dream Girl would give to the dumb guy in, like, 500 Days of Summer. Um, like, it just, it's just very funny. I had never seen this before. In all of my reading about the two of them over the course of my life, I have never seen this. And I saw it today and I just lost it. I was like, yes, it's going to be Lizzie that I'm talking about because that, to me feels like it would become a Twitter meme or X meme since we're no longer on Twitter anymore. We're on X. But it just seems like something would be like people calling each other Guggums and Dove. I need it to be a movie. I need that to be part of the movie. But on the like the, the darker note, his family was quite cruel to her, which is unfortunate because his sister was involved in the pre-Raphaelite movement, which meant they saw each other quite a bit. But Lizzie was from a lower income bracket than uh Rossetti's family and so they very much like frowned upon her and also she was like she was a model like 
that sat for their paintings. And this wasn't like a, a Cara Delevingne kind of situation. She was not she, being a model to a bunch of like nerdy literary theorists artist was not like that's not what you were striving to be in society back then so they didn't get married for a really long time also he had like a aversion to marriage so the whole thing just kind of like was not a great situation so by 1855 their relationship completely fell apart also because dante was a cad um (laughs) It was just, it was a messy situation. And, you know, that's what I like about movies that are, like, messy people. I love messy people. Um, so she basically gave up with her studies with him, decided she was going to go to this art school in Sheffield, be away from London, be away from all of these people, and do her own thing. Um, but by this point, her health was quite bad. There's a lot of different debates about what her problem may have been. She had a lot of tummy issues, which, as we know, all hot girls have tummy issues. So this does make sense. It feels so seen. Right? (laughs) Like, I don't know what kind of, like, she had intestinal problems. And I was like, hot girl summer with tummy problems. I get it. But also she was addicted to laudanum, which could have also been playing a part in this. But she was quite ill. But, you know, good news for like five seconds. By 1860, she and Dante rekindle the relationship. They finally get married. They have enough money at this time that they go on this like elaborate honeymoon to Paris. They're gone for like half a year. They come back to London. She's finally pregnant. She finally gets to like live out this like life that she wants to have. But then the baby is born, stillborn. She falls into postpartum depression, which obviously they have no real concept of back then. You just it's it's not a good situation this exasperates not only her illness but also her addiction and this leads to february of 1862 the couple go out to dinner with a friend of theirs dante goes to the working man's college where he teaches lectures weekly lizzie goes home when he comes home after teaching he finds her unconscious in their bed they are unable to revive her. They like try to do a stomach pump. They try like all sorts of things. She is gone. It is ruled an accidental overdose. However, it is reported. And I believe the story gets out essentially because he tells somebody in his like group of friends. And we all know these guys sit around and drinking and smoking and running their mouths. And so there is this rumor that like kind of follows him for the rest of his life that She committed suicide because he allegedly found a suicide note pinned to her body that basically said, like, care for my brother. Um, Her brother had learning disabilities, and I guess that is, yeah. Um, And he destroyed it because, obviously, the beliefs at the time, suicide is illegal. It is also immoral, meaning she wouldn't have been able to have a Christian burial. Not that either of them are particularly religious, but we all know that people care more about it at the end uh, than anything else. Um, so she has given a Christian burial. Dante never recovers from this. Like all of his paintings, even after he like tries to move on, still look like her. He's still writing about her. He is just like, he's never the same person again. And you have to remember this like a 12 year relationship that had like so much like ups and downs and turmoils. Like she always haunts his like thoughts in a way that I can just see in a movie. When she's buried, he buries his manuscript of poems with her, like the only manuscript of poems that he has of his own work. But then seven years later, he decides that he wants to exhume her to get the poems back and to publish them because he wants to like pay homage to her memory because like some of the poems are about her. They obviously didn't have Google Docs. He couldn't just like recover the files. He Men claimed- have nothing but the audacity. I'm nothing sorry. Nothing but the audacity. But also <laughs> like, so they exhume her. Seven years after her death, and he claims that she was still in pristine condition and that her hair had grown no. after. And obviously, this is probably not true. They probably, like, opened it, grabbed the thing out, and, like, because hair falls out of the body when it decomp. But also, like, reading this, I was like, okay, so can we canonize Lizzie Siddle, patron saint of right. tummy issues? Like, I was gonna say the patron saint of hot girls with stomach issues. Right? I was like, honestly, she's canonized. Boom. <laughs> there you go. From the church of Maggie Nicole. <laughs> yeah, she, she is our saint now. Yes. Um, it's just, it's so interesting. And that's like, a lot of people think that that was just like weird London gossip, basically, because you have Rosetti walking around looking like he's haunted by a ghost. And then you, 
you have him exhuming her grave to get poems that it's just it's peak drama like the fact that I love these two so much explains so much also with my fascination with Wuthering Heights because it's the same sort of like extremely toxic yep. you just don't want to look away from it relationship but I think what's also like so interesting like I know obviously I, I slammed the Effie Gray movie I don't like that movie I the whole time I watched it and I was like this could have been done so much better first of all better casting so sorry but there's just there's so many women that were involved with the pre-raphaelite movement um and in this what a lot of academics and historians now refer to as like the pre-raphaelite sisterhood which includes as i mentioned dante's sister christina also jane burden morrison georgiana burn jones annie miller fanny cornforth alexa wilding effie malay uh, Evelyn de Morgan, Maria Zambaco, and Marie Spitali Stillman. So, like, these are women that not only sat for these artists that we all know, but also were painters and writers and poets in their own right. And I think that their stories are often like overlooked. And I would love to see something that focuses more on them than just the men that use their beauty to become famous. I love this. I am fine right there. Also, we did not do this on purpose, but we lined this up well. It's so perfect. Because we're going to go from talking about, you know, an artist muse to talking about a woman who made an artist famous. And so next, if anyone has talked to me in the last like year, year and a half, my Van Gogh family obsession has been running rampant. Uh, and also I'm just going to say, I'm going to use the anglicized pronunciations of all the names I'm talking about to simplify things. After May, whenever I was in Amsterdam and in England and saw Van Gogh's in both place, I was like alternate, alternating saying like Van Gogh, Van Gogh and Van Gogh multiple times in a conversation. And I'm not going to do that to y'all tonight. Um, I'm just going to say Van Gogh. Um, but uh, I've been doing a lot of research on the Van Gogh family recently, particularly Vincent's brother, Theo, and his wife, Jo. Uh, his brother is my dog's namesake. Um, I, I love Theo and Jo a lot. Uh, and Jo is basically the person responsible for turning Vincent from a failed artist who only sold, you know, a painting in his lifetime to one of the most famous artists of all time. And it's a name that not a lot of people know. And what's what's really interesting is to look at the fact that Theo Van Gogh in their, you know, the time that they were alive was much more famous than his brother Vincent because he was a really celebrated art dealer. And he knew, you know, he was one of the first people to like buy Impressionist paintings and to really see worth in their work. Um, he bought a lot of early like Manets and Monets. Um, and he also like really helped Gauguin in his career as well, uh, as well as, you know, financing Vincent's entire career. Um, but... Joe, who who would become Theo's wife and Vincent's sister-in-law, was born on October 4th, 1862 in the Netherlands. Her father was an insurance broker. She was the fifth of seven children. And she was really smart. And unlike her older sisters, who sort of were, were pulled from school and put to working in their household, she was allowed to continue on with her education. And she studied English. And she actually went to London and worked at the British Library on a project for a while. Uh, which is quite cool. She was also a teacher at a girls' boarding school in Elberg and then at a girls' secondary school in Utrecht. Uh, and she was also a really gifted piano player. So really just sort of brilliant all around, very interested in the arts. Uh, and her brother, Andres Bonger, I think, I'm, I don't know if I'm saying any of these names right. So please bear with me if we have any Dutch speakers who listen to our podcast. Uh, but he was one of Theo van Gogh's best friends in Paris. Theo had moved from the Netherlands to Paris uh, to pursue his career in, in an art dealership there. And so she, Joe first met Theo when he came home with Andres on a visit to Amsterdam. After they like hadn't known each other for that long, he proposed to her kind of out of the blue. He was immediately smitten with her. Um, and she refused him and basically was like, what the hell? Um, and there's these diary entries from around that time with her being like, you know, like, he seems like a nice guy. I wish I could have said yes, but I don't even know him. Um, she also had her eye on someone else at the time. But she ran into him in Paris like a year or so later. And um, ran into him from what I remember on the street, like, and was like, oh, hey. And suddenly was more interested than she had been before. Um, I don't know what was different this time. I've seen photos of Theo, though. He, he, he would turn my head on the street. 
So soon afterwards, they become engaged. And right after that engagement happens, the incident with Vincent's ear getting cut off occurs. And so Theo sort of has to abandon their engagement celebrations to go and deal with all of that. And the way that she supports him through it and is really invested in Vincent's well-being sort of speaks to what their relationship would be like the entire time that they they were together. She knew that in, you know, marrying Theo, she was also really taking on the care of Vincent. Um, and I think that's that's one thing that is so astounding about her is that even though she actually only met Vincent a handful of times, she really dedicated her life to him and, and believed in his genius. She and Theo got married in 1889, and their only son, Vincent Willem, named for his uncle, was born the following year. And she really worked hard to build that relationship with Vincent. Uh, she, you know, insisted that they name their son after him. There's actually a letter that she wrote to him because a lot of how they got to know each other was through letter writing. And she wrote him a letter in the early stages of labor. Like, she's basically like, hey, the doctor's like here. Like, they're kind of waiting for it to actually happen. But like, what to let you know? Which is, it's it's the most darling letter, honestly. Um, and he in return, you know, he had been sort of worried when Theo announced that he was getting married because the brothers were, you know, very close at that time period. They lived together for a while before that. Um, but he really came to love Joe as well. Um, unfortunately, though, not that long after the baby is born, Vincent uh, dies by suicide, or at least it's it's still, you know, widely believed to be suicide. Um, and Theo's there with him. And things seem okay for a little while. Theo, you know, is sort of dealing with all the logistics of Vincent's death. But then things go really downhill for him. And he, you know, obviously is dealing with a lot emotionally. And he also, you know, some people say he died of tuberculosis. There's also the fact that um, other people believe that it's it's completely because of the late stage syphilis. And he actually sort of went crazy, um, had to be straight jacketed, uh, was violent. And, and because of the fact that he was going through like late stage syphilis, probably, um, which was obviously very difficult for Joe to be dealing with. And, and so she sort of is dealing with all of that. And then he passes away and Joe's 28 years old. She has a, a baby who's, you know, not even like a year and a half old, thousands of paintings belonging to mostly Vincent, but also other artists because Theo had been a collector and like this legacy that Theo had sort of tasked her with because she knew that when Vincent died, Theo really wanted to set out to make sure that the world remembered him. And Joe took that upon herself to do since, you know, Theo had died so early. Uh, and so she returned to the Netherlands she, she, you know, took the baby and these like thousands of paintings and sketches with her and all of the letters between the brothers. And after mourning for a time, she took up the work of ensuring Vincent's legacy. She opened a boarding house to support herself and her son. And then she organized exhibits and sales of Vincent's work. She made use of a lot of Theo's connections because he was really well known in the art world as a dealer. Uh, and she also was the one who prepared Vincent and Theo's letters for publication. She edited them and she talks about in her diary that she got to know both of them better through these letters that they sent to each other because she'd not known either of them for that long in their lifetime. Um, and she talks about what a sort of emotionally laborious process this was for her because she's dealing with her own like grief and then having to sort of relive it every time she's working on these letters. But she also uh, wrote a biography of Vincent to sort of go in front of the letters whenever they're first published. And that is still today considered to be like one of the best sources that we have about Van Gogh because it was, you know, written by someone who actually knew him. And she also consulted Vincent's mother and his sisters in writing it. The other thing that she did, though, was that she tried to keep as much of the collection together as possible and really only sold pieces where she felt it would be strategic. And so that that collection she passed down to her son and it actually became the basis of the Van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam today. Uh, and she eventually did marry again an artist named Johan Cohen Gosschalk. Marriage didn't go super well. He died not that long afterwards. In 1905, she co-founded the Amsterdam Social Democratic Women's Propaganda Club. Um, which was designed to help improve working class education and women's working conditions. She was a member of the Socialist Party, and she later sort of said that she regretted that she didn't do more for the party during her lifetime, but that she devoted so much of her time to raising her son, and she felt like that 
was, you know, along with her work for Vincent's legacy was sort of what she had to give to the world. But she died on September 2nd, 1925. And what's interesting is that the first biography of her was actually published in 2019 in Dutch and finally came out in English in 2022, which is wild. It was written by Hans uh, Lushten, who's the senior researcher at the Vincent van Gogh Museum in Amsterdam. And so it is like a very thick, hefty volume with like everything known about her. Um, but it's kind of crazy that with how much is written about the van Goghs, no, no one's ever really thought to write a book just about her before which is kind of insane. Now her letters to and from Theo, uh, sort of in between their engagement and their marriage have been published in a volume called Brief Happiness, the correspondence of Theo Van Gogh and Joe Bonger. And um, they are really lovely love letters. Like they're, they're really nice actually. Um, I highly, if you can get your hands on a copy, I do recommend reading them. I do think it's interesting that there's like a lot of films that have been made about Van Gogh, obviously, uh, and she features in basically none of them. I think she has like a little bit in um, Loving Vincent, but a lot of the movies about Van Gogh, even though they typically do feature Theo at least, uh, she appears in almost none of them, which I think is a real shame because she's the reason that we like know who he is today. Um, and, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of people that we sort of owe the legacy of someone to. Like, I know that it was, um, oh gosh, who was it for Emily Dickinson? It was one of her relatives after her death who really like put everything together. And so many of these artists that we revere as sort of the greats of all time were not famous in their own lifetimes. And I think that we don't often recognize enough how much work and labor someone connected to them did to take them from a, you know, sort of failure as an artist to someone that we know, you know, today and, and who everybody is aware of. There are a couple of novels based on her life, a couple of handful, uh, a couple of plays as well. Supposedly, there might be a movie coming out at some point based on one of the novels. Uh, but she also does appear as a main character in the musical Starry, which has a cast album that is available online that I highly recommend. It sort of is about her and Theo and Vincent and based very heavily on their letters. Um, and is sort of, from what I've seen, the most accurate portrayal of the Van Goghs and anything that's sort of fictionalized. Uh, but yeah, Joe's my girl. And I just, it really is my mission to make sure that everyone appreciates how much she did to ensure that you know her brother-in-law's legacy would be remembered and it really blows my mind to think about the fact that she was 28 when Theo died and left her with this sort of mission and, and a baby um because that's how old I am. I was gonna and, say that's how old you are girl yeah and I wouldn't be ready for that so no yeah I'm just sort of in awe of her I love that. I think it's so funny that you said that you weren't going to do the Anglo you were going to do the anglicized versions of their names because the next person we're talking about I specifically am using <laughs> her actual name and not the anglicized name that she is the most well known um with yeah. that name. Um but I am I'm, I'm also going to butcher every single other Gaelic well, name that I say because the she's issue, the only name I know. The issue with the Van Goghs too is that like they're Dutch, but mm -hmm. they also spent so much of their lives in France that it's like, and I never know, like, do I use the French pronunciations? Do I use the Dutch pronunciations? Like, because it seems like when in France, they maybe went by the French pronunciation. Yeah. So it's, it's a whole assimilation. I mean, that's them. that. Yeah. It's assimilation. Yeah. So that you don't well, have to keep yeah. like telling somebody you're you're pronouncing that wrong yeah it's so and like i think whereas because i i know who you're doing next and i'm very excited yes. about it but i feel like that's more of an issue of like reclaiming that name mm -hmm. um because that that was a you know that is the name that she went by so yes and and this yeah. one is so funny because like i care so much about saying her name the way that it like it should be but i don't care at all about any of the men <laughs> yeah. in her life <laughs> i literally was like i should try to learn these names and i was like you know what Nah. Yep, um, mood. So who doesn't love a good pirate tale from Pirates of the Caribbean to Black Sails? We've had this like really healthy supply of piracy coming into these ports over the years. But there is one story that has not appeared on the silver screen yet, which is the story of Grania Whale. 
I learned today from my lovely Irish coworker that even though it looks like it would be said like male, which is possibly like where they got O'Malley, it's actually said whale, like the, the fish in the ocean, uh, which is very interesting. Uh, do love the way that Irish and Welsh words do not look at all <laughs> like how you say them. Um, but yes, I am talking about Grania, the pirate queen of Ireland, who is known mostly as Grace O'Malley, the anglicized version of her name. Now I will say, yes, there is a musical about her, which is funny since Nicole was just talking about Starry and a musical that actually features this, this figure of history that she loves. There's a wonderful musical about Grania, which is called Pirate Queen. It features one of my favorite scores I have used. There's a song called Woman in it, which is like oh, so one good. of my favorite if, songs. I, <sighs> if you are fans of Les Mis yes. and like Miss Saigon and you're listening to this and you've not heard the Pirate, Pirate Queen game. score, you need to go listen to it because it's by the same composers. It's Stephanie J. Block and Hadley Fraser. I also happen to know that I was in like a Pirate Queen phase right around the time that Maggie and I became friends. Yes. Um, so I this think is that's actually how we like found each other. I think it might be actually <laughs> like yeah, yeah, yeah. Les Mis fans for the opera, but I do yeah. think it was the Pirate Queen because I was hyper fixating on it. You were hyper fixating on it, yep. and none of our other friends were. So it was, and like, I also think that's how we discovered that we were like both into history too. Yep. Like yep. yeah, because I was in college. You're getting ready to go into college. Yeah, no, yep. yeah, yeah. It's so cute. It's, okay. it's so fun. It's <laughs> such a good musical. I I love that song. Every time I'm like, I need some sort of like inspiration I just put woman on it's such a good yes, song it's so um, good. but I, I want her to be in a movie I want a, a much longer much larger telling of her story and also one that's not quite as like fictionalized as pirate queen because yeah. there's a lot of like fictional aspects of that sorry Hadley. um <laughs> <laughs> I'm like it's that weird thing of like in the I musical I'm all for it but like I want a movie that doesn't do that <laughs> exactly yeah um so she was born in 1530 to the Omalia dynasty. Grania eventually took over leadership for the lordship um, by both land and sea after her father's death, usurping her half-brother. This is most likely because she was actively involved in, um, I'm just going to use their, their last name that we all know by now because it's just easier, but um, I'm using Grania for her first name. So she was actively involved in like the O'Malley's seafaring enterprise from her childhood um, and actively took part in plundering and piracy as a young girl, whereas her, her half-brother wasn't really as involved in those activities. So that's most likely why it went to her. Grace's plundering and, and you know, Grania's plundering and piracy missions took her as far afield as Spain. Um, and also to, like, the Isle of Barra in the Outer Hebrides. The O'Malley's had this, like, really long established trade links with Spain where they imported iron, weapons, and exchange and wine in exchange for things like salted fish and pine marten skins and fleeces and cattle hides and tallow. At the age of 16 in uh, 1546, she was married to a man by the name of Donal. Uh, which is also the exact same name as Donal Gleason, um, if you want to know. It's spelled Donal like Tonal, which is the same as the, the way that Donal's name is spelled. It's a fun thing. I realized that today. I was like, oh, that's the same <laughs> I name. I never thought about that. And all the I times I have, like sung how often his name is in that score. Yeah, it's the <laughs> same name. Who knew? Um, who was <laughs> He was this heir, um, heir to the chief of the name of Clan O'Flaithberita. I I, it's a really long word and I'm pretty sure I said it wrong but so basically he was like this heir to like uh, another big faction in Ireland so really this was like a political match uh, they had three children together one of whom who was actually the youngest child um, became quite the monster when he grew up he beat his sister Maeve um, refused to listen to his mother basically because she was a woman had no interest in listening to her or obeying her and it is said, so his name is Murag. He joined forces with the man who killed his older brother, Owen. And basically because he thought his bread was buttered better over there uh, than following his mother. Uh, and it is said that Grania was like, I refuse to ever speak of him or to him ever again. Like she just cut him off completely from her life. I just, an absolutely insane. Like I would love to see that, like what led to him being so psycho. 
ha- like I would love to see that on a screen, like getting into that those details because it seems like Owen and Maeve were normal. But he, as I mean, you know, sometimes the youngest children go crazy in a, a trio. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a thing that happens. <laughs> <laughs> so like that that happens. Uh, so then in 1565, um, ten years after they got married, Donal is killed in an ambush while hunting in the hills surrounding Lof Corrib. Um, after his death, Grania allegedly took a shipwrecked sailor as a lover. Um, but that affair only lasted like for a couple of days because he's also killed. Um, he's killed <laughs> by the by Clan McMahon. Um, and she allegedly like takes vengeance and she like goes and she finds the people who killed him and she like slaughters them all uh which again so cinematic and you also have to remember like a lot of grania's story is basically become like a fairy tale almost or like arthurian lore like it's very much like that there's like a lot of stuff that's like that doesn't seem real that probably didn't happen that's suspicious but also there's other aspects of it that seem, I'll talk about one in a little bit, that seem like they shouldn't be true, but most likely are. <laughs> which I and which again makes for like a really fun, like pulpy story because you can embellish parts and play with things. Like it's not as cut and dry, and you can have a lot of fun with it. So the same year that her husband dies and her lover dies, she then remarries. <laughs> And has her fourth child, uh, whose name is Tibbet. Tibbet! <laughs> Tibbet! Tibbet! I know, it's a great name. Tibbet, I'm sure it sounds much different if you're Irish. So Tibbet is born at sea, and the legend states that she literally, like, gives birth to him, and then Barbary pirates attack their ship, and she gets up after, like, having him, and just, like, goes and, like, kicks ass like fresh from childbirth and a lot of male historians don't believe this to be true but like a lot of female historians are like yeah no that makes sense and you have to like contextualize it again this is a woman who has literally fought tooth and nail her entire life this is also her fourth child i you know she probably was like blood on my thighs blood on my hands we're good to go like badass lady right here and i just also like how how cool would that be as as a scene in a movie like Like, the thing about her story is that it just is so cinematic it's so cinematic like move over pirates of the caribbean this is the new epic pirate story because she she has such an expansive career as a pirate and like so many really like fascinating points in her history like you have like two husbands you have all of this kid drama and then you have tibbet and tibbet is like a drama of his own tibbet got embroiled in a conspiracy against the english which if you know 16th century english politics with anybody in ireland or scotland or wales was very contentious so he gets himself and it's it's not even clear if he was actually involved or if somebody was just like hey i don't like you i'm gonna implicate you in this because he gets he gets in really big trouble like the kind where you get hauled off to jail and you're probably gonna get killed uh for treason uh and that kind of fun stuff and this is this is the moment in history that i think grania is the most well known for it's a really great moment in the musical as well an infamous for Queen Elizabeth I's reign. So essentially, after Tibbet is arrested, Granny is like, I'm going to have to take things into my own hand if I want to save my son. So she basically requests an audience with Queen Elizabeth I. And like, contrary to all of her like advisors and you know, military governors, Elizabeth I grants this like meeting with her. They basically come to each other as two older women who have, like, lived lives. And they come to an agreement. There's only a few people in the room, so we don't really know exactly what happened. But, like, Elizabeth I, indeed, like, first-person account that this happened. That this whole, like, moment happened between them. There is a lot of people who think that, like, there was some, like, weird politicking as well. Because, like, Grace called herself the Queen of Ireland. And, obviously, Ireland didn't have a queen. And, like, there's a lot of the stuff. But... Based off of, like, what we know from how Elizabeth presented it and how other people in the room presented it, it didn't seem like any actual weird politicking happened. It really seemed like it was a woman who came to save her son. Queen Elizabeth does. Towards the end of um, 1593, 
Queen Elizabeth uh, wrote to Bingingham and ordered the release of Tibbet, um, another Donald that he was all that was also involved uh, in this this mess, uh, and Tibbet gets to live. And obviously, Grania is just relieved. Um, and also, I realized I didn't mention Grania's second husband, whose name is Richard the Iron Bork. And he's he's kind of a non-person. He just seems kind of chill. I don't think he would cause too much drama in the story. You have to be like a pretty chill guy to let your, you know, to, to hitch yourself to a woman who's out pillaging and plundering on the weekends. And they just seem like they have a decent relationship. But I think what's the most fascinating and the most perhaps important aspect of Grania's story is that she lives until the age of 73, which is relatively unheard of in the 16th century for a woman who has had four children. I mean, most women, childbirth takes you out. She's also traveled like all over the place. So she had a rock and immune system, clearly. And like, it's just so interesting. So often we have these stories of women, like obviously the one that I used, Lizzie Siddle is a tragedy. But this isn't a tragic tale. This this isn't a woman cut down in her prime. This is a woman who is remarkable and powerful and fearless. And she gets to live to see the glory of that. Like, she has so much to her name. Like, she, it's just, it's a story that needs to be told. And I think it's a, a story that is just, as you said, it's so cinematic. And I really loved um, this quote that I found from a biographer, Ann Chambers, who wrote, I set out to find a woman behind the image, the image of the pirate queen and what a woman she was, as well as a leader of a private army by land and sea, intrepid seafarer, rebel, pirate, political tactician, I'm going to say Grania, uh, was also a daughter, a wife twice, twice over, a mother of four children, a divorcee, a lover, a grandmother, and a matriarch. And I think that makes the story. And I think that that's a story that just needs to be told. I think it's a fascinating, compelling, inspirational story. And again, at this time period, it's wild. I completely agree. Yeah. And I think that it's one of those stories that like, it really could be filmed in a way that it would rival like a, you know, it would sort of belong to that whole sphere of like a brave heart, a gladiator, a, you know, and I, and I think that it could be yeah, quite cool. And we also just don't to get enough groups. Yeah, and we also just don't get enough Irish stories. I agree. We also don't get enough pirate stories, honestly. We also don't. Like, like the fact that I was like my pirates. The fact it was like Pirates of the Caribbean and Black Sails. And I was like Pirates of the yeah. Caribbean, which was like my teenage years, and Black yep. Sails, which is my college years. And I've been yep. I mean, yeah, we have um our flag means death, which is great and fun. But also it's like it's a farcical story. Like right. I want like, I gritty love... Oscar bait. Yeah. I love our flag means death, but like I yeah, want I love like it. big cannons go boom. Like yes. <laughs> and the woman being the one to make those big cannons go boom. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, I just, I that is, her. you know what? I, I would like to see this the energy that was brought to the casting of our flag means death, though. Yes. Brought to a movie about Grania. Um which is great. And you I know what? It. Well, like, um, look at the soundtrack from the musical. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. We'll we'll just turn it all into instrumentals and put it all in there. Yeah, we'll, yeah, yeah. We'll or we'll get, like a, we'll get like a pop version of Woman. Oh my god. Oh my god. I'm obsessed. like Adele. Adele could sing it. Yeah, yeah. No, we gotta get like like a oh my god, what is her name? Janet something. She's like oh, an yeah, Irish yeah, singer. Yeah, yeah the Irish you know singer. I mean? Yeah. Janet like Devlin or something. Yeah. Yeah. We'll get her to do it. I need the Irish women will there. be the on the soundtrack. Yeah, too. exactly. Yeah, yeah, we'll just get a bunch, and then we'll have some sea shanties. Um, and obviously, and honestly, honestly, uh, Donald Gleason will be in it as well. Yes, he will be. He can play like the last husband, yeah. like the chill one. Uh, <laughs> love that for him. All right, well, switching gears a bit, jumping forward a, a couple of centuries. Uh, I actually, I was sort of struggling to pick a third woman. There's so many women I would like to see movies made about, but. I was sort of thinking about, you know, what are real gaps? And I think that we don't really have that many movies about indigenous women, particularly ones that are like in any way, shape or form good. You know, like I was Googling like movies about indigenous women, movies about Native American women. And it kept being like the animated Pocahontas. Did you want the animated Pocahontas? And I was like, no, that's, that's not what I'm looking for. You know, especially with Killers of the Flower Moon coming out later this year, maybe 
I would love to see more movies about indigenous women, like written and directed by indigenous women. Um, because I, over the past few years, like we have seen some really cool stuff coming out um, by indigenous creators. And like, I would love to see them telling the stories of some of these amazing women throughout their history, because I think that more people should know about it. And I was looking around and I would really love to see a movie about Dr. Susan LaFleche Picot. I looked it up. It said that's how it was said. I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing anything. That is what Google told me. Uh, and, you know, I, before I started doing some research, I'd never really heard much about her, but she's amazing. And she's the first actually like indigenous person to hold a medical degree in this country. And the fact that the first person to do it was a woman, I think is super cool. Uh, and she was born in Nebraska territory in June of 1865. And she was the youngest child of Chief Joseph LaFleche or Iron Eye uh, and his wife, Mary. And he was actually the last like formal chief of the Omaha tribe. And it's said that as a child, she really loved the people of the Omaha tribe, but she also saw the poor conditions in which they were living and all the issues that they were sort of having as a people who had gotten, you know, pushed out West uh, by white settlers. And when she was young, this, this is what the legend says, but it's well documented enough that I think this may actually be true. Uh, when she was young, she witnessed a elderly native woman die of sickness because the white doctor basically refused to treat her. He kept saying he would come and they kept sending someone saying, no, we really need you to come now. And he never came. Uh, and so she, you know, that like sparked her desire to become a doctor, to be able to help the people of her tribe. And she, you know, sort of from the beginning knew that if she became a doctor, she would not refuse service to anyone, no matter who they were. And she was homeschooled until she was 14, but then she attended the Elizabeth Institute for Young Ladies in New Jersey um, because her father was sort of uh, one of the chiefs who really believed that the best way to deal with the white people was not to sort of ignore them and hope that they would go away or to sort of fight back actively, but to sort of learn as much as they could and prepare themselves for how to live in what the world was clearly turning into. Um, so he really wanted his kids to sort of be as well prepared as possible to live in, you know, the world as it was taken over by these American settlers. And at age 17, she returned to Nebraska, and she actually taught at the Quaker Mission School on the Omaha Reservation for two years. But then she met this Harvard anthropologist named Alex Cunning Alice Cunningham Fletcher. And Alice really encouraged her to seek further education, and she helped her get funding to go back east and go back to school. Um, and eventually, she applied to uh, the Women's Medical College of Pennsylvania. And you know, it's really fascinating because this is a time period in the 1880s when, like, you barely have any white women getting medical degrees. So for this, you know, indigenous woman to get one is is sort of even more impressive to think about just how much she's up against uh, while getting it. But she graduated as the valedictorian of her class in 1889 uh, at the age of 24, which, again, to, like, cycle back to this whole thing of looking at what these women had, like, achieved by a certain age. I mean, I, even today, it would be impressive to have a medical degree by 24. <laughs> I certainly don't uh, or didn't. But so after she does an internship for like a year in Philadelphia, and then she returned to Nebraska. And she really worked to teach the Omaha people about things like food sanitation, um, window screens to sort of help prevent like bug spread illnesses, and also treating tuberculosis, which was a big issue with the, the tribe at that point. She married a man named Henry Picote in 1894, and they had two sons. And she apparently, when she was doing house calls, would often just bring her kids with her. And she, you know, did not let being a mother stop her from being a doctor. Uh, but she treated over 1,200 patients in her lifetime. She made house calls uh, on her horse named Pie, or in her little buggy and wagon, or buggy and horse. Um, and she also would cook meals for poor families. And, and they say that she, you know, acted also sort of as someone who would give legal counsel and would, you know, get, get a family whatever they needed. She really was much more than just a doctor in her community uh, because she really wanted to help these people any way that she could. 
Um, she also worked really hard on the temperance movement. She had seen the effects that alcohol had 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 and on her people and the way that sort of the white settlers had used alcohol against the the Omaha people. She really worked against it. Uh, but, you know, sort of ironically, her own husband actually ended up with a drinking problem. And they think that it, it worsened his tuberculosis, uh, which eventually did kill him. But she really had a dream to open a hospital so that she wouldn't have to send people to a bigger city to have a surgery. Um, and in 1913, they actually were able to open a hospital in her name, had five private wards, a maternity ward, and an operating room. However, by that time, her own health was declining, so she wasn't actually able to work in the hospital, but she did sort of live to see it done. And in 1915, she died at the age of just 49, but had really accomplished an incredible amount, you know, in less than 50 years of life. From what I found online, uh, that hospital from 1913 is actually being restored today to be a wellness clinic for the Omaha tribe and people in the sort of surrounding area, which I think is super cool. I love when sort of older buildings get repurposed for something that reflects, you know, the modern usage of it um, and in such a cool way. I think that's amazing. Uh, in 2016, a biography of her came out for the first time called A Warrior of the People by Joe um, Starita, and a PBS documentary about her also came out. But from what I could find, there's never been like a film or sort of a creative project done about her. So I would really love to see something about her because I think that, you know, I, I found in sort of researching her that there were several like modern Native um women who are doctors who said that like they were inspired by her story to sort of, they saw that she had become a doctor. And so they thought, well, then I can do it too. And I think that's really amazing. And, you know, especially thinking about how many issues native women still face today in this country, it would be amazing to sort of have stories like this that really uplift them um, and don't sort of like center around white men. You know, I, I love me a good Pocahontas story I, I think Sakajwa is amazing too. And like, there's all these women that sort of white settlers had more contact with that are awesome. And I think it's, it's great that we tell their stories, but I also think it's so important that we tell the stories of women who really were focused on, you know, their people and on giving back to them. And I think that a story like this of someone who sort of, you know, took what she could learn from uh, white Americans and applied it to help, you know, her people with issues that had largely been caused by white Americans. Like, you know, we know where the tuberculosis was coming from. Um, but I, I think that's such an inspiring story and sort of an inspiring story too, and sort of, you know, seeing something that your community needs and becoming it. So yeah, I, I'm just obsessed with her and I definitely want to uh, buy that book now and read it. But if someone wants to turn it into a movie, I think that would be amazing. Like, especially, I think it would be so cool to see like a, an indigenous woman write or direct. I totally agree. I think that is definitely a story ripe for the picking. You know, it, I think it's really fun that we were able to turn this weird situation in where like, I'm technically not allowed to talk about um, yep. <laughs> stuff on podcasts Yeah. Um, and like still wanting to tell rel like, relatable things that are like connected yeah. to the industry but not uh, really yeah. created really fun episode and I would love to do something like this in a future episode maybe if the strike continues on but you know pay your yeah. writers pay your actors because yeah. I think it is really important and I think this kind of goes back to the roots of what we originally wanted to do with this podcast which was to be both film and also talk about like the historical stuff and like the historical topics that we were interested in and this yeah. helped us explore things that we all like otherwise wouldn't be because these movies don't exist exactly. so we would if not talk about them <laughs> anyone wants to recommend us topics that we could talk about like if the strike does continue on and the studios don't like you know agree to make a deal soon enough soon, yeah you know, obviously there's other things that we could do. We could talk about like pet peeves and historical films or something mm -hmm. like that. But if you've got any topics that sort of don't center around specific films, we could do something like books we'd like to see adapted, you know, like uh, that are either historical fiction or, or classic novels or something yeah. like that. Just let us know I if mean, anybody has any suggestions. I mean, before this episode, we were talking about historical romances that, you know, yes. are great. So turning yeah. those into movies and television, I mean. Yeah, exactly. We're we're definitely open to sort of doing more things. I mean, we could do like historical love stories or something that we think yes. would make good movies. Like I can talk about, you know, 
any any number of of historical love stories. I I don't know yes. how we haven't gotten a Czar Nicholas and um what Truly. is her name? Alex movie yet because that's that's ripe for the picking. Um but yeah, cuz we're, you know, we're going to keep hopefully we want we want to still bring you guys content. But we also, obviously, Maggie, as a member of of SAC aftra has certain stipulations on her right now. And we yes. also just want to be supporting uh, the people who are on strike because we obviously stand by them. And, you know, in, in an ideal world, we would see the studios actually, you know, come to a deal soon and and agree <laughs> to the, the truly very little that is being asked of them. But I don't have much faith that that's going to happen super soon. No. So let us know. We're happy to keep doing episodes like this. And there are ways that you as enjoyers of movies and television can help. Um, please do not cancel your subscriptions. Please continue watching your favorite television shows. Continue re-watching your favorite movies. And please go to theaters to see the movies that are out right now. Because all of that helps the people who are on strike. Because they cannot promote their work. And nobody has called for a boycott. So if you see somebody on Twitter saying, I'm canceling my subscriptions and you should too, they're wrong. They do not speak for any of us. We do not want people to cancel their subscriptions. In fact, sign up for them. Help. Because here's the, the, the thing is that if everybody ups and cancels their subscriptions, it benefits the studio's narrative that streamers are unreliable. And so that hurts what we are fighting for. So please do not hurt what we are fighting for. And... I was going to, you know, say you can donate to the SAG After Fund if you want to help. But today, The Rock, Dwayne Johnson, donated a seven-figure sum to the Actors Fund, which helps people who are striking. And I cannot speak more highly of that fund, not just because I am in SAG, but at the, st or the start <laughs> of the pandemic, I got money from them because I was not able to continue working as a stand-in on the TV series I was working on. That foundation, that fund is so beneficial, as are all of the other funds that are crowdsourced right now. And we're going to have a link of them, um, like a list of all the links in the, um, the description of this episode so that if you are able to help, there are also links to snack funds, to helping bring water and snacks if you're located in LA or New York. There's just a lot of ways to help. There's also like a a, whatever a, a variation of like a prime wish list uh, mm -hmm. to help um, get different materials that the people who are on the picket line need. Like there's so many different ways to help and also just sharing information directly from the sources or from people who are in the union who are getting information on the back end. Like it is so important to hold that line um, across the board. It's a really and weird situation. Yeah. And I do want to say, too, that um, the rules of this strike are somewhat complicated. Um, and I've seen some misinformation going around. So just know that there are people who are working right now and it is not breaking the um, picket line. There are productions that have been given the go ahead by SAG-AFTRA, by independent studios that are OK mm -hmm. to continue working. There are caveats within, you know, not every part of SAG is on strike. So broadcasters just, are not on strike. That's why if exactly. you uh, if you watch CNN right now, they're really yeah. pushing Barbie uh, yeah. because they're the only people who can. And so just don't you know, if I, I feel like I've seen some people making assumptions whenever they see yeah. people who are working in some manner and just don't assume that someone is. Uh, you know, a scab. Like there are people who are scabbing. Like, obviously. oh yeah. But, but the thing about scabs is that yeah. they will make themselves known. They are right. not going to be people who are simply doing their jobs and keeping their head down. Because right. let me tell you, it does not feel good to know that you like have to write reviews for things from struck companies. Yeah. As a member of the union, it does not feel good. But also, like, it's my job. Right. <laughs> so don't make and, me like, feel worse. You know, there are certain people who are who can't contractually do it. I also know like a lot of studios in the UK, they feel like, you know, those actors and those yeah, writers they're are in a completely weird different equity. Yeah. Yeah. Because they would they would like to, you know, be able to show their support, but their contracts are separate. So I just yeah. wanted to put that out there because I've seen a lot of people sort of, you know, being judgmental towards people and, and just, you know, don't assume that you know unless you are well read on the rules of all of this. And they are changing too. You know, we're getting more and more updates. The important thing is just to really listen to, you know, what is coming straight from the union. Yeah. And remember, 
It's the studios that are our enemy. It is not each other. Yes. Um, well, thank you so much for joining us in this very special 50th episode of Petticoats and Poppies. We would love to hear from you on social media and to hear what female historical figures you would like to see movies made about. You can find us on social media at HGATM Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. You can find Maggie over at Maggie of the Town, and you can find me at Nicole Ackman 16. I just realized that we can't say Twitter anymore. It's X. Okay, listen, oh. I will say X when I am dead. <laughs> and you have X's on your eyes. <laughs> literally, literally. Uh, you can listen to our podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, the Airglue Media website, and on Audible. If you like what you hear, don't forget to leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts, Podchaser, or on Spotify. We occasionally read our reviews that we haven't had any in a while. So, like, maybe leave us a review. Let us know what you think. Yeah, you leave us a fun comment. We'll read it out. Leave. I mean, if you want to just write a joke or something, we'll read it. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's your way to get airtime uh but we will be back soon with another episode as we continue to talk about period films in whatever way we are able to you've been listening to petticoats and poppies history girls at the movie Tibbet. 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 <laughs> Tibbet. Okay. Tibbet. I know, it's a great name. Tibbet. I'm sure it sounds much different if you're Irish. Tibbet.